you need to think about honestly about where you are in your career and your notoriety and then conceive the book according to that in a way that's appropriate to that. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for managing and running and building an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. Because here at Business of Architecture, our goal for you is that the business of architecture shouldn't get in the way of the architecture. And if you haven't already checked it out, go check out at smartpracticemethod.com. Go get access to our 60 minute firm owner masterclass. We've packed that with all the learnings and research that we've done over the past decade plus about how you can structure your practice for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial reward. And if you haven't already come to work with us in our smart practice program or, or know about our smart practice method, what are you waiting for? There's no, no reason to reinvent the wheel. Come on over here and let's help you build a practice to suit your life. And today we're going to be talking with Jorge S. Arango. And this is going to be an amazing interview. Absolutely looking forward to it because we're going to talk about publishing a book on your work. And uh, Mr. Arango has has done 12 books already, working on his 13th. And he recently published a book that he's going to be telling us about, Monograph. Um, and so really looking forward to this conversation. We're going to talk about everything from how to get it out there to particulars of the process. As a matter of fact, we have eight tips that we're going to give you uh, that you should consider if you want to get your work published, if you want to get seen, if you want to get your message out there. How does all this happen? And uh, Jorge has been doing this for a long time, so I'm really super quite excited to have him here on the show. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you. you know, nice to be here. You're welcome. So that was an abbreviated uh, introduction, but I do want to give our readers a little bit of a, a background on Jorge. Jorge Esarango has been writing about architecture, interior design, and art for over 40 years. His work has appeared in many publications, including House and Garden, House Beautiful, Elite Decor, International Versions of Architectural Digest, Metropolitan Home, and many more, including The Rob Report and Luxury Magazine. As I mentioned, he's a co-author of 12 monographs with designers such as Juan Montoya, Stephanie Stokes, uh, with Rizzoli, Kate Ritter from Vendome, and many others. So we're going to talk about his most recent book here that was just recently released by Rizzoli. Jorge is also the art reviewer for the Portland Press Herald. He lives in Portland, Maine, where he's talking to us today. And he also contributes to Maine Home and Design Magazine, New England Home. Additionally, he's edited Keys to the Enneagram, which was an interesting conversation that we had. Quite a varied, varied experience there. So with that introduction, Jorge, let's get into... First of all, let's talk about the the most recent book that you published, and who is it for, and just give us the the the, the short version of why why we're talking here today. Sure. So the latest book is on the work of Orlando Diaz Esqui, who is a Cuban-born, San Francisco-based uh, architect and designer. He has been around for a long time. He started at Gensler, which is now the largest architectural firm in the world. And he started his business in the 70s in his, his own firm, uh, which is called Orlando Diaz Esqui Associates. And he has published, he had one book published initially, also by Rizzoli, which was sort of all his work up to about 2010. The latest book, which is called Soul, uh, The Interior Designs of Orlando Diaz Esqui, is work that has happened since 2010 up until now. So that's the focus of the book. It uh, also pulls in his tremendous career in licensed products and designing furniture and accessories and lighting and so on for many of the world's big, big firms. Uh, and it mostly is interior design projects. They are grouped by certain elements that are the soul of the project, which is why it's called Soul. It's not a whole lot of copy. It's really just about what the essence of each project is. And so there are titles, chapter titles like Air, Light, Water. Um, so it's really, it's a beautiful book. We're really proud of it. And Jorge, you not only contributed and in, in, you, you had a much broader scope than just the copy. What was it that you, tell us what you did uh, in terms of this particular monograph? Sure. So this one, um, I think Orlando was sort of 
reticent about the process, and so he really counted on me to really manage the whole process for him and teach him how it works and collaborate on the titles of everything, the title of the book itself, um, working with the art director, editing images, um, working on the sequence of chapters, how they should fall in the course of the book. And, uh, and then, of course, interviewing him for all the projects that he designed. And then also his other two associates who um, have since bought the name of Orlando de Sesqui Design Associates, Odada, which is what the firm is known as today. But it is under the, um, the aegis of Orlando de Sesqui Associates. So he's, yeah, so it, I, you know, it was fun. I did a lot of different things for him. Beautiful. So let's talk about these eight points here. Number one is decide first what you want your book to accomplish. What are the various things that designers, architects should consider when they're thinking about publishing a book? Right. So I always tell uh, architects and designers that the book is not going to make you famous. It's not actually... Um, it's not going to get you more work, likely. There are many reasons to do a book. You can do it to simply have a record of your designs throughout your career. This is, uh, Orlando's book is that. It's mainly to have sort of a, uh, you know, a three, like a something you can hold in your hands that shows the legacy of his work in the world. Um, Many uh, architects and designers will do it simply as a PR tool. So if you have a client who is coming to you, thinking about hiring you, then you can give them this book, and it tends to actually help you basically close the deal. Um, other people want books just to sort of place their work within the context of the architectural world in general. So you need to decide what you want it to be. And that's the very first thing um, you should consider because it also will determine what publishing houses you want to go to because there are some that are sort of more general interest. There are other ones that are more scholastic or academic. So if you want to do a book that is placing your architecture within modernism in general, for example, and you want it to be an intellectual book, then that might better be handled by something like Princeton Press rather than a big commercial house like Rizzoli or Vendome. So that's your first thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And Jorge, when, when, would it, when would it be appropriate? When should, if someone wants to publish a book, how much work should they have? I'm probably one question they might have in their mind is, am I ready for a monograph yet? If I'm, if I want to get a monograph, let's say we're focused on the monograph. If I want to get that published, how much work should they have? When do you think is the right ideal time in their career to go for that? Or is there a right time? Well, um, I think you need to have a good amount. You have to, like average cocktail table books are from 250 to 320 pages. So Orlando's book is the max. It's 320 pages. He's been around for a long time. And so you need to have not only a good amount of projects, because books eat up a lot of photography, but you also um, should have, um, you know, a point of, a, definitely a strong point of view. And ideally, um, I would say, you know, you, you should, like Orlando's book has, I think, 13 projects in it at this point, um, and then another chapter on the licenses. So, uh, so you should have between, you should have at least, I would say, 13 to 15 projects for a good size book. Yeah, and what are the logistics? How difficult is that to go back and get photographs of those spaces, coordinate that with the existing people that live there, the tenants, et cetera? Is it, how big of a challenge that's is that? A, Sounds like a logistical that's a good question. undertaking. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, so uh, normally a lot of architects and designers have their photography already because they photographed it for their portfolio, which is fortunate. However, some of the things they need to consider 
uh, are who owns that photography. So, for example, um, you know, if Architectural Digest photographed your, your project, that does not necessarily mean that you have access to that, right? You have to see what Architectural Digest's publishing rights issues are. Um, the same with a photographer. You may have signed first publication rights with that photographer, and then you have to pay for images any time you publish that subsequently. So you really have to look at your contracts. Um, normally, though, there's a, architects and designers have a lot of photography that's already accessible. It's just a question of permissions that you have to ascertain. And then some publishing houses will give you a budget for photography. This is all stuff that you negotiate individually with each publishing house. So for Orlando's book, for example, there was one project that uh, had been shot, but the photographer had died. And so we couldn't f get our hands on the original images. And so we ended up having to reshoot that. Uh, and then we reshot another, pro we no, didn't reshoot, we shot a project that he had just finished in New York. So I was part of that too. I was doing the styling work and working with the photographer on what angles to shoot and so on and so forth. So, you know, it will be a combination. Ideally also, you don't want all of your projects to have already been published. You need to save some to surprise people who might be familiar with your work. So Orlando has two unbelievable projects there that he saved that are that have never been seen and are just phenomenal. One of them's on the cover of the book. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. All right. So we have next decide what sort of book we want. A picture book with light text, more intellectual approach, et cetera. You kind of you kind of talked about this before, but it also deals with the kind of publishing house that you might decide to pair with. Can you tell us more about that? Right. So each publishing house has their particular style too. So for example, Rizzoli is not into publishing books that have a ton of text. Basically, what both my editors there for two different books I've done have said to me is, we want you to be able to understand this project just by the photography, so if no one even read a word of it, right? So they don't really like to publish text-heavy architecture and design books. Someone like Princeton Press, on the other hand, because they have a very prominent architectural school on the campus, and it's famous, and they will be more interested in the theory of architecture, any kind of intellectual interpretation of that architecture, placing it within the context of modernism or traditionalism or whatever. So um, that was not this book, even though we do talk about Orlando in the introduction as being one of the progenitors of soft modernism, mm. because he started doing that years before it has become kind of ubiquitous now. So it's going to determine what kind of, you know, what your approach is, is going to determine what publishing house you're going to select. Okay. And then connected to that is point number three, how much control do you want of the layouts and presentation of your work? Right. So that is, um, so I just spoke with, I'm in talks with a firm out in Chicago about writing a book. They want to control the layouts. They want to be able to lay it out themselves. And I have another designer I worked with on seven books, actually, Jeffrey Bradfield, who also wanted to have those pages laid out the way he wanted them because he had a very specific idea. If you are working with a house like Rizzoli or Vendome, that doesn't happen. They have book designers on staff that create those layouts, and then you can certainly work with them to alter them however you feel is necessary. But if you want that control, it's best to self-publish with a house like Glitterati or Panache or Asuline, right? So it just depends. I mean, some designers are really particular and architects are really particular about the way that their work is presented in a book. So, um, but if you are willing to go with a house like Rizzoli, for example, or Van Dome, they have very competent and talented book designers that will do beautiful works. I mean, the books that I've done with Rizzoli have been really gorgeous. And with uh, Stuart Taborian Chang, which was the first book, she did a beautiful job. 
So, you know, it just depends on how much control you want. Consideration number four is the angle of the book. What should someone consider when they're thinking about the angle and why is that important? Well, everybody thinks their work is fantastic. Right? Of course. So, yeah. I mean, who thinks, who has and, an ugly baby? Let's face it, right? Exactly, right, exactly. So, you know, it's not about, you know, especially if you're not A.M. Stern or Frank Gehry, you know, or one of those Stark attacks. If nobody knows who you are or you have a very small local clientele, just saying, here's a book on my work is not going to really probably be very marketable, right? So, and, and magazines may not want to pick it up editorially because who knows who you are. So you really, you, sometimes you can actually um, make it part of a larger concept. So for example, the first book I did was called Harlem Style, and it was the work of various designers, but primarily one designer named Rod Shade, who was fairly new, right, in the industry, but Harlem, as a place to go live, was taking off. This was back in 2001, I think, or 2002. So to call it Harlem Style had a different sort of appeal on the book stands. Right. And people were and it had appeal, you know, within black bookstores, for example, throughout the country, because it's associated with the Harlem Renaissance and so on. So you have different markets that that got to. So, you know, you have to figure out what's your theme. So you might be a southern designer, for example, and it might be the new southern architecture. Right. Give it a catchy title. Orlando is very well known, so he really didn't need to do that. I mean, he's been around for so long. So, so that's, you know, you, you need to think about, honestly, about where you are in your career and your notoriety, and then conceive the book according to that in a way that's appropriate to that. Beautiful. How to think about a budget. Here we go. This is the question on everyone's mind. How much does it typically cost to, to put out a book like this? And I'm sure there's ranges. What would talk to me about the money question? What are we looking at here? Right. So again, it depends on what kind of book you're producing. So if you're, if you are self publishing so that you can have your own layouts, you can have complete control of how it's presented. Self publishing, Generally, um, those books run about a hundred thousand dollars, and then everything else, like if you want special foil papers, or you want a uh, leather binding, or you want uh, you know gold on the ends edges of the pages, all of that adds up. So this firm I was talking to just yesterday about doing a book on their work has already done some of that self-publishing work and they were quoting them between a hundred and two hundred thousand dollars. You are also required if you're self-publishing to buy a certain amount of them, like a thousand books or 500 books or whatever. Each mm -hmm. one has a different stipulation. So, you know, you have to consider that cost. Um, with books by commercial firms like Rizzoli and Van Dome and so on, those are completely individual contracts. You know, they usually, I, mean, I wouldn't even say, I would, wouldn't even attempt to guess what, you know, an average would be because they do differ. It depends on the size of the book on not just the pages, but the trim size of the book and what sort of, you know, paper you want and, and all of that. So, um, so, but though that will generally cost you less money because there is a budget there they have for production and they're picking that up in anticipation of that book selling. So, yeah. um, and then within that, there are budgets for the writer's fees for any kind of photography that needs to be done. Again, all of it individually negotiated per book, per house. Okay, excellent. And now let's move on to consideration number six was the particulars of the process. What are some of the particulars of the process? You mentioned pitching the book, contract with the writer, photography. We've kind of touched on this, but give me the lowdown on the particulars of the process someone can expect. 
Right. So uh, again, it uh, it will depend on who you're you're working for, whether it's a self publishing or commercial publishing. But um, you're going to want a writer, unless you have very good writing skills yourself. Generally, I think in in many of the architectural books that I've read that are written by the architects, they tend to be a little academic, esoteric, remote, right? There's, they're not really accessible to a reader. So I always suggest they get somebody who understands a commercial writing style or, you know, more popular writing style, layman's popping writing style. You're going to want to, uh, to get your author. You have to have a really good rapport with the author. The author, you have to feel the author gets who you are. And in that process, if you are working with a commercial house, they will have a certain amount of money that they are giving you for the author, but you will likely have to kick in some money yourself as well. So I don't know any writers who at this point work for less than about $10,000 a book, really prominent writers. Yeah. So, and many of them, many, much more than that. Yeah. So Orlando definitely paid me more than that. Yeah. So, um, so there's the writer, the photography, that's something we've talked a little bit about already. You have to secure permissions to all of the images you want to use. And, and of course, get a photographer to shoot the projects that you have not shot or to reshoot projects that you can't get permissions for. You have to okay this with all of the residents of those projects, of course. There are two projects in the book that we cannot use in our public relations and marketing materials because they're very, very private clients. So, you know, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is with, especially when you get into very high end architecture. So, uh, you have your photography, you have your writer, um, you have your book designer. So it's good to meet early on. You will always meet early on with the book designer to talk about what the general concept of the book is. So they get an idea of what you're going for. And in those meetings, those fundamental initial meetings, you decide on what the aesthetic of the book is going to be. And then, it, then that becomes a whole process that you go through. It's not just, I mean, it's sort of organic. It happens throughout the entire process. And, you know, if chapters got too long, you have to winnow down the photography. It's a whole long thing. Um, yeah, what else is part of the process? So, you know, there's also pitching the book. I mean, I'm talking as I'm assuming at this point that you have a contract, but if you're going to pitch the book, sometimes the writer will pitch it for you, which I have done for many books. Sometimes they will uh, match a writer to you. And in those cases, it's really important that you have a good rapport with them because they're coming to you not knowing your work generally. So, um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, a, um, if you've worked with somebody on many articles about your work over the years in magazines, that might be a, and you feel like what they say about you is a good process versus done well, then, um, the likelihood is that you'll have a really good relationship with that writer. Um, what else can I tell you about the particulars of the process? Um, yeah, I mean, it is pretty organic. Um, generally, you want to turn in, you know, books take, on average, about six months to really get through. Sometimes it takes longer. It depends on whether you run into issues with the writer or the photographer or the design of the book. Or, But generally, it's about a six-month process. And you turn copy in mostly instead of like by chapter, you usually do like half the book. And then if you're pitching it, you have to actually turn in a sample chapter. So they have an idea of what you are presenting and you have to send them a ton of photography so they understand what the look of the book is. So, you know, it depends on whether you've got a contract already or you have to actually pitch the book. Beautiful. 
possible snafus or high costs that have risen the pandemic age? What should people be looking out for or consider in that area? So be ready for surprises is what I am telling people now because the pandemic has really changed lots of things. Uh, there are supply chain issues in every industry. Publishing's supply chain issue has to do with paper. So it is actually causing all sorts of snafus in magazine production and book production because they don't have people working the mills. Some papers are available, some papers are not. It, it really is a very loaded issue right now and it can delay your publishing schedule. And the other issue is, which happened to us, um, it got stuck at the ports. The shipment got stuck at the port in, in California and could not be transferred over to the distribution center. So the first book signing I did, we had no books. So we had to kind of, we had one display copy, the advanced copy. Oh, and then we would take, yeah, it was really, but that's because it was coming from Hong Kong. That's where it was printed. And then it got stuck in the ports and you know, what can you do? That's just the nature of the game these days in the pandemic, everyone's being affected. Yeah. So be so. prepared for surprises, work that into your expectations and your plan. All right. Number eight, eighth consideration here is how to get your monograph out there. What should we consider? Right. What have you seen in this area? So publishing houses generally have their own marketing teams. Um, some don't mind if you hire a PR person, an additional PR person to supplement their efforts. Other ones tell you not to. I've had different houses that have said different things. Um, we do have someone who has helped, um, Rizzoli, the man there is very good. He's really terrific. He just, uh, he just got us a, an article with the wall street journal, which is coming out tomorrow in fact. And, um, you know, but we did have somebody else who has connections to lots of magazine editors who is helping us be part of events. So the first book signing was in San Francisco at the fall antiques fair where, you know, a lot of designers and architects shop. And so it, but it was with, it was a book signing with 16 other designers who were publishing books at the same time. So the other thing that has happened recently is because people ha stayed home during the pandemic and they didn't travel, you know, as you know, the building industry is completely overloaded with people who took those that money that they had saved that they would normally spend on other things and they've done it they've used it to improve their house to put an addition to redo a room you know all of that so um so that means there's a lot of competition out there because many designers are publishing books at the moment so uh so yeah, I mean, work with another PR person if you can that has good connections with the magazines. Most design and architecture magazines have sections where they talk about new books that have come out. So that's a no brainer. That's really kind of easy to get into. But then you also have to have um, projects that you can give exclusives to at different magazines. So we had a set of projects that we could offer to magazines based on what their subject matter was their and their basic style was. So one house is filled with art. And so we pitched that to a magazine called gallery because they're all about art in the homes. So magazines are one way podcasts like this are another way, uh, radio shows, and that's what your PR person will be able to help you with. And of course your own connections. I worked with another designer, who went to a blogging conference and learned all about blogging and started a blog. And it turned out to be the hottest selling design book on Amazon for the 10 weeks or something like that. And it was because she really got herself out there and learned how to do the blogging and got into the whole blog sphere, right? That's not every designer or architect's particular forte. So that might be harder to do, but, but it does help if you can market across platforms, 
blogs, podcasts, magazines, television shows, local television shows, national television shows. If you've got a lot of celebrity clientele that are willing for you to use their name, that of course helps a lot because then the shows go, oh, well, here's, you know, Ellen DeGeneres' newest house. Who's not going to want to see that? So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lot. And, um, and you have to start working on those events probably like four to five months prior to the release of the book. Okay. It's not too bad. I was, I thought you were about to say four to five years. No, <laughs> no, no one would work that because yeah, well, the, the book might not happen actually. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Okay. Jorge Arango, thank you for joining us here on the business of architecture. How can our listeners reach out to you for more information, or perhaps they'd like to discuss with you the possibility of their monograph? Mm -hmm. So I uh, have a website, um, which is very outdated, but that has my contact information on it. Um, they can always email me. It's my email is my name, Jorge, J O R G E at J S as in Sam, A R A N as in Nancy, G O.com. Beautiful. All right, Jorge, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks. It's been a pleasure to speak with you, Ina. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.